Welcome to the dispersed workshop, Missionary Objects and Collecting 16th, 20th Centuries. I am Sabina Brevaglieri, and I'm thrilled to launch a talk series I have designed and conveyed as a first step into a project aiming to contribute to the collective undertaking of thinking the future of non-European objects and collections in Europe today. This set of talks explore the missionary engagement with objects and collecting through time and space. Missionary object is an operational concept which draws the attention to the complex dynamic of both physical mobility and cultural transformation, which permeate the tension between objects produced and belonging to local indigenous communities around the world and the missionary agency. The complex entanglement between missionary object and collecting and the competitive and conflictual colonial spaces is a major issue for this work. Indeed, Colonial logics, asymmetrical power relations, and jurisdictional competition can hardly be separated from missionary action. However, missionaries are religious actors, and their experience and personal engagement in the local fields are integral to apostolic commitment and evangelization purposes. Religion emerges as substantial driving force in shaping the complex meaning of missionary objects, as well as in continuously reconfiguring them in their context. This series engages with missionary practices of object attention, selection, accumulation, and monopolization. Creative practices of resistance, keeping alive the indigenous worship, have been addressed as well as anti-idolatry campaigns aimed at the physical material destruction or epistemic aggression of the sacred matter. Such violent actions generated complex forms of missionary knowledge on indigenous objects, which mediated their agency into the colonial archives and museums. Missionary travels and circulation across the world triggered complex perception and reception dynamics. Display and exposition create new publics. Competing patrimonialization processes underpin the current question of object preservation as an entangled right, the objects and bodies. The talks investigate South and Mesoamerica, Philippines, China, Ethiopia, the Congo, as well as Italy and Rome. The series provide the possibility to compare different forms and situations of missionary engagement by focusing on Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuit and Capuchins, as well as Saverians. The talks argues for a long lasting missionary attention to objects and engagement with collecting practices. Still existing objects today preserved in European museums are being addressed as material evidence of discontinuous and often invisible dynamics of both eradication and sedimentation, which reconfigure their meanings, uses, and values through time. Therefore, talks trace back to the 16th centuries and early modern times, aiming to unravel object histories and meaning well beyond the culture of curiosity. Within this framework, the 19th and 20th centuries missionary museological thinking have been addressed, and under investigated missionary museums imbued with ethnocentric connotation and strong colonial imagination are being explored. These exploratory series concentrate on the Catholic world to draft both an innovative research agenda and new methodological tools, which has to be expanded through comparison and entanglement with other denominations and religions. This dispersed workshop represents an attempt to overcome separation between disciplines and scholarly communities and foster dialogue, cooperation, and partnership between universities and museums. I would like to warmly thank all speakers, institutional partners, colleagues and participants for such a collective undertaking. I wish you a stimulating 
visit through the dispersed workshop missionary objects and collecting. Enjoy the talk. Uh, a representation of cultural history of indigenous Americas, uh, of the people of indigenous Americas in contemporary world was produced to a large extent as a culmination of long lasting processes that have experienced the capture and displays of objects of, of other cultures within collection and museums. However, today's ethnographic collection are the result of complex historical transitions from a first ambivalent feeling of desire and refutation, which inspire explorers and conquistators in the face of the object they were encountering the new world. Then we experience the interest toward indigenous ingenuity turn into an ethnographic interest that will find expression in natural history and ethnographic museums. So the museum displays of Amer Amerindian artifacts could be investigated from multiple perspectives. Those of the history of collection, as Davide amazingly did last week, and also those connected to the political process of restitution to native communities. However, in my brief talk today, I will try to pursue a different aim, uh, focusing on epistemology of material culture as it developed within the, within the production of the Franciscan order in the New Spain during the 16th century. I will focus on missionary strategies through which indigenous artifacts were conceived and classified under the rubric of religion. On the other hand, although most of these Amerindian artifacts have been captured from their context and refunctionalized, it should be not underestimated that they are capable of conveying a, negoti a negotiation between words. So that this material otherness expose Western observers and audiences to the scandal of, the, of diversity. In this perspective, I intend to focus on the reciprocal relationships that, was, is, that is established between, on the one hand, museum institution and collection, and on the other hand, uh, with, uh, by anthropological and historical religious sciences, which are those scientific disciplines that arose precisely on the ground of classification of primitive culture. As ethnographic museums are, in fact, places of construction of knowledge within which collection emerge as a form of power and the sort of production or even invention of the catalog culture as a whole. While indigenous artifacts apparently remain the same, they are actually inserted in transformed frameworks and contexts. So the aim of this talk is therefore to observe the foundation of these strategies looking back at the first European encounters with indigenous people to analyze the main feature and the epistemological limits of the missionary perspective toward indigenous objects. A second self-reflective reflective aims concern the history of religion and aims to explore the way in which religious thought in early modern history would have influenced the strategies of displaying exotic and primitive objects but also conditioning the scientific studies of religions. I will focus on how the Franciscan engage a confrontation with indigenous religiosity and institute an opposition between material and immaterial elements. Nowadays, ethnographic museums sometimes transform the biographies of ethnographic objects, mainly accepting them as authentic artistic production. As in the case of religious indigenous objects, will experience a twofold, a double taxonomic shift. The ethnographic objects, in fact, before, before becoming a piece of art and consequently receive an institutional definition and a validation, were inspected and scrutinized by, by a taxonomic and theological missionary eye. So that indigenous sacred matter had to go through that, that grille conceptuel that Bernard and Grzynski described in the Magnificent book on idolatry. Sacred images dematerialize sacred things and depriving them of the possibility of being manipulated. The specific object of, my, of this intervention, of this talk, is located within the dialogical space among different cosmographic formations, what we conventionally should call religions. And that were generating following the encounter between missionary orders and indigenous religion. 
In New Spain, these negotiation processes involve not only the sphere of theological thoughts, but every aspect of life, transforming daily practices and reorganizing spaces. The impact of missionary action also extended to material culture, for example, to the widespread distribution of sacred screen things of religious objects in the landscape. I will try to show how eradication, extirpation of idolatry, the destruction of idols and temples, the replacement with Christian images, had also consequences on, on an epistemic ground. On the one hand, Franciscan promoted systematic campaign of destruction of, the, of idols, while on the other hand, tried to assimilate Mesoamerican sacred matter sub specie religionis, it, which means inventing some polytheistic gods comparable with those of the classical world. Mesoamerican ritual showed peculiar form of representation of the divine that were materialized by giving shapes to bodies of extra human entities through impersonators, priests, which were dressed in, by, in specific diagnostic insignia, made of plants, animals, minerals, stones, precious objects, feathers, etc which are men, men, means to establish social relation with the environment. So I will focus on a particular case of missionary aggression against material representation of a group of gods, water and rain gods of the Valley of Mexico, observing the ambiguous relationships that the Franciscan engage with singular figures known as Tepictoton, literally the little molded ones, which were replicas of the mountains built by modeling a duff of amaranth seed with organic, organic fluids, mostly blood, produced by human cells. One of the problems that arise when observing ethnographic religious objects in museum is, that, is the facts that were not originally produced for that kind of region, obviously. I'm not intending here to elaborate a critique of the colonial and political strategies of ethnographic museums. Instead, I'm interested in reflecting on this double taxonomic shift that has brought or forced ritual object, objects to be institutionalized by museum and art institution. Thanks to Alfred Gale's proposal for a renewed anthropology of art, it could be possible to observe not only the violent decontextualization of ethnographic objects, but also the, the difference, the friction between words explored in between by the Franciscans. Therefore, I will try to work from a re reverse perspective uh, in relation to the, to the previous uh, webinar, which means analyzing the criteria and the strategies that control the selection of the objects that could enter the spectrum of missionary attention and recognition. In other words, analyzing the condition of possibility that led an indigenous artifacts to become visible and finally to be exposed. In order to propose some preliminary reflections, it will be possible to briefly observe some display strategies relating to religious artifacts in the perspective of this double taxonomic shift that I mentioned about. Particularly on the way in which Mesoamerican extra human water entities were placed within the frame of an exhibition dedicated to the culture of ancient Mexico, the treasure of the Aztecs, which was held in Italy in 2004, just as a sort of example to start my reflection. The first aspect I would like to emphasize are, are the fact that the religiously oriented representation of this exotic culture as visible in the hegemonic place of the whole dedicated to God's religion and rights. A sort of generalized representation of indigenous culture as naturally religious. However, I will mainly focus on the representation of the religious prayer displayed in this specific section and how it, it is dominated by a polytheistic interpretation of Aztec religion. And the indigenous artifacts that represent human water entities we can notice our representation of Chalchitlique, the goddess of water, for example, a small stone sculpture preserved at the Museo Nacional de Antropología of Mexico City, was chosen as a classic representative prototype of the iconography of the gods, the goddess. According to an iconographic interpretation, then, some peculiar insignia of the goddess, the characteristic band on forehead and cotton ornaments,
are considered as indexes of the goddess, immediately combine the idea that in Mesoamerican religion, as in any other polytheistic religion, there was a separation, a division between the divine immaterial prototype and its material image representation. Another depiction of the same water goddess is placed in another section of the exhibition called Nature, Man, Hearts, demonstrating how polytheistic God should be considered connected to the limited sphere of reality, in this particular case, nature and water. The same strategy appears in relation to uh, another artifact depicting another god of rain, of water, Tlaloc, also preserved at the Museo Nacional de Antropología. However, this is not only a statue, a representation of a god, but an artifact intended for ritual use, usage as a vessel disposed to contain amulets, bone, relics, etc. Obviously, this is not an isolated object or an exceptional object. The exhibition also features a series of vases, containers, braziers connected to the iconography of water gods that were not only simple representation of gods, but objects designated by a characteristic and recognizable iconography. But however, this separation produced by the creators of the exhibition is not entirely convincing. Materiality in Mesoamerican religion were not limited to the production of divine representation of statues. And we will notice that the missionary were perfectly aware of the fact that indigenous artifacts materialize a profoundly other religious thought. While they seem to appreciate, sometimes appreciate indigenous ingenuity and technical ability in profane, in profane spheres of human activity, on the other hand, they reactivated a Judeo-Christian literature against idolatry in order to find the very idea that Mesoamerican objects are not simple and inert representation of, divine, of the divine, but active entities. As recently noted by Johannes Neurath, Amer Amerindian art did not experience the need of a Western, and I will say Christian art, to achieve an impossible goal, that is, to ensure a posthumous life to object, a sort of Nachleben, Mesoamerican representation are not archetypal ima images, nor even anthropomorphic form of universal types embodied in some kind of pathos forme. Mesoamerican, did not, Mesoamerican religion did not express the permanent presence of a distant gods, maybe fixed in some, in a way, subspecie eternitatis. Otherwise, they are ephemeral moments of culmination through which Mesoamerican culture intend to construct and manipulate recognizable images of their divine prototypes, but in order to domesticate their agency and control ontological transformation. The working hypothesis, my working hypothesis, is that missionary action is the result of a theological theory that aims to dev devitalize religious objects. In other words, it seems to lead the idol into the reassuring space of the hieratic anthropomorphic representation, which eventually will become hearts, capturing ritual Mes Mesoamerican objects as they were fetishes in the perspective of Marc Auger and Bruno Latour. If it, is, if it is true that we have never been modern, the missionary have engaged in an anti-idolatric struggle precisely because indigenous materiality revealed the scandalous entanglement between the image and the prototype. As Serge Guzinski clearly noticed, the struggle between true religion and idolatry was a false antithesis. Religious images and idols are not apparently separate ideas, but actually belong to the same theological model However, is this false antithesis reveal a Western obsession toward figurative and anthropomorphic representation that guided every interpretation of other religion that conveys a sort of return of the repress of this iconoclastic fear. These tensions reemerge in Mesoamerican idols because they represent a not combination, a sort of contamination ritual context between matter and prototype. In fact, the relation between God and its representation is not only indexical, 
The prototype does not only constitute a visual representation that makes the specific entity recognizable. There is something more. If we shift from representation to construction, from the image oriented by sides to the thing manufactured by hands, it will emerge that for those who manipulate them, the images end up being the same thing as the prototype, as they are immersed in a cycle of construction, distribution, consumption, destruction. It may be useful, uh, before starting analyzing uh, Mesoamerican texts, focus on two Nahuatl terms concepts connected to these religious aspects. I will recover the recent work of Molly Bassett, as it mainly focuses on the construction of a Franciscan religious literature. I will focus on two terms, Teotl and Teuxiptlawan. The first term, which, was, which has long been identified by scholars as an equivalent to, to the polytheistic gods, has gained different attention since the pio pioneering work of a Danish scholar, Ari Idefeld, in 1958, who proposed instead an association with an impersonal force, mana. Although, in, fa in fact, Teotl was used as a noun to indicate a particular class of extra human beings, the term was associated as a compound with a large number of, ob of objects and to denote five different aspects. A teotl was designated by properties and possession, attributes that indicates a specific identity. A teotl could, could then be placed within that object that possess a destiny, a fate, a day sign, a fortune, a privilege, um, or among those agents who possess a privileged pur purpose or, or, and status, for example, kings, sovereigns, who for this reason possess in exclusive use objects that could have been the quality conferred by the notion of Teot. Finally, Teot were also those people and objects consider on one hand marvelous and worthy of esteem, as for example, gold, Teoquitlatl, from Teotl, divine, and Quitlat excrement, and on the other, beloved and valued as for cer some ceremonial insignia for the exclusive use of kings and nobles. The second concept, that of Teixiptlawan, which Basset translates as localized embodiments, and which would be formed by Ishtli, eyes, face, surface, and the root sheep, refers to peeling, flying, shaving, and to the transitive suffix tla, to form the general meaning to cause someone or something to be treated or to be characterized by the entity denoted by the source noun steam. This includes a large amount of artifacts that in Mesoamerica, Mesoamerican religion took, for example, the form of familiar statues that, have, that we already uh, observe, but also bodies of so-called impersonator covered with the diagnostic insignia, sacred bundles known, uh, known as Tlakimilolli, which contain precious objects considered indexes of the divinity itself, and finally also effigies built with natural materials, including the Tepictoton, which we will focus on later. In other words, the ships were receptacles of power, places in which the recognizable presence of the divine prototype manifested itself. The actualization of a force in an object in which there is no difference among the divine essence and its material support. Since the first impact with Mesoamerican culture, the pervasive Mesoamerican idolatry generated a strong and decisive opposition on the part of the conquist conquistador, as shown by the very harsh pages dedicated by Hernán Cortés against idols. As Grzynski shown, after a phase of substantial detachment from idolatrous practices and a certain ethnographic interest that can be read in the accounts of the first exploration, testified, for example, by the writings of Christopher Columbus and Ramon Panet, with the arrival of Cortes in Mexico, there's a change that probably depends on the specific nature of indigenous form of religion. But above all, it's produced by the transformed political condition of colonial enterprise. If in fact, still during his first travel, Columbus wondered if the natives worshipped idols or not, 
In the Cartas de Relacion, Cortés instead proposed a ferocious, anti-idolatrous language which reproduced a stereotyped image of indigenous religion. Cortesian iconoclastic fury, which gave rise to a systematic destruction of Mesoamerican artifacts and substitution of Christian images, obviously goes to the treatment of the ability of recognize the identity of single human, extra human entities. The general and generic notion of idols produced by uh, Cortes produce a selective perception of indigenous culture, once again, based on a figurative and anthropomorphic representation. It will therefore be useful to observe how in his second letter to Charles V, the V, in a passage that has been become extremely famous, Cortes confronted with the construction of these particular idols made of edible materials, which fall in the rubric of the statuary. If idolatry was therefore capable of neutralizing any ethnographic interest, things become more complex when the Franciscan order took possession of the evangelization on, of New Spain. However, the change of perspective show how even the first missionary were influenced by an anti-idolatrous imaginary which was gradually adapting to the new condition produced by the prolonged coexistence with the indigenous people and therefore by the persistence of their religious practices. To observe the missionary tensions toward indigenous materiality, I will dwell on the work of two famous Franciscan ethnographers, Toribio de Benavente, Motolinia, and Bernardino de Sago. The work of Toribio de Benavente, known by the Nahuatl name of Motolinia, represents a perfect starting point to observe the missionary representation of indigenous God in New Spain. The precocity of Motolinia work produced interesting consequences, since his writings appear to be imbued with the optimistic climates that distinguish the beginning of the novo Hispanic missionary action. Mm. In this context, the issue connected to indigenous God, emerging from the very beginning of his, one of his two works, the Memorialis, the representation of indigenous past starts with the definition of indigenous Mexico as a sort of traslado del infierno. The discursive strategy is explicitly related to the Old Testament. As Motolinia is quoting here a passage of the book of Joshua, recovering biblical controversy against sacrifice. The discursive strategies of the memoriales, creating an exemplary link between the, the history of the people of Israel and that of Mexico, ended up with the writing of a unique history of humanity, which is entirely a struggle of Christianity against the devil. The structure and argumentation in Motolinia's struggle against idol is carefully recovering that discursive production of early Christian literature developed by the father of the church. The discourse on the characteristic of true God, which characterized the exordia of the apologetic tradition, reproduced in the form of dialogue to demonstrate the truth of Christianity by contrasting idolatry. For example, in the exordium of the Apology of Aristide of, of Athens, a work centrally known in the Americas during the, the 16th century. Uh, the idolatrous interpretation allowed the Franciscan to think of American religion as a sort of demonic parody, so that Motolinia immediately tried to identify a preeminent diabol di diabolical agent capable of orienting the whole idolatrous system. The missionaries are in fact convinced that the need to believe in a sole creator is dangerously deceived by the perverse imitative action of the devil. So the first quote, which is here in this slide, the first quote that Motolinia dedicates to a native god is therefore the invention of a parodic communion that the Indian would have practiced with the body of Tezcatlipoca, one of their most important gods, which Motolinia intended here as an indigenous incarnation of the devil itself. We are just in front of an elementary but effective theological dispositive managed to hide the emic meaning of indigenous practice and subsume and to subsume the entirely uh, them entirely in the rubric of sacrifice as an idolatrous error and a demonic parody, erasing in such a way any possibility of understanding the indigenous contraction 
and consumption of divine bodies. In this alleged demonic cult of Tezcatlipoca, the missionary can identify the responsible for the confusion in, indigen in indigenous religious life. This idolatrous communion obviously reveals itself as a semantic reversal of Eucharist. Human sacrifice cannot be accepted or understood as a cultural subjective institution. That is a sort of neutralizing dispositive, once again, part of a symbolic and theological capital of Christian apologetic tradition, which already appears in the work of Justin, such as the dialogue with Trifo, or in this first apologia, in which the imitative action of demons in the mystery of Mitras was described as imitation of Eucharistic liturgy. Once Tescatilboca has been identified as the devil, Motolinia can expose how idolatry is reproduced through a overwhelming proliferation of gods. Then, in chapter four of his first treatise of the Historia, the Franciscan proposed a sort of repertoire of Mexican idolatry. At first glance, the inventory of idolatrous facts lacks any kind of order, grouping together the most diverse realities within a sort of generic, all-encompassing all category. In Motolinia's eyes, the materiality of indigenous idolatry is pervasive, inexhaustible, and meaningless. In this description of idolatrous feature, the construction of Amar and Siddhaf images is actually lost within a, this large list of idols. The Indians had innumerable idols and in many places. They are in temples, they are in courtyards, in the woods, on mountains, along roads, idols are close to water, spring, trees, crossroads, neighbors, oratories. They are made of stone, seed duff. They are large, small. They can represent men, women, wild beasts, snakes, birds, eagles, tigers, owls, even the sun, the moon, the stars, the big fish, even frogs and toads. Nevertheless, this totally disordered repertoire is only partially authentically Indians. Once again, Motolinia quotes biblical references of some passages of the Deuteronomy the the and the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Moreover, Motolinia still tried to apply an elementary interpretive, interpretive model, which is in the, in the scientific study of religion and polytheism would eventually be defined as naturism. The reference to nature for elements has a double function. On the one hand, it promotes a first selection of those, all those countless Indian gods, while on the other hand, it once again describes the Indian era in theological terms. In fact, the friars identifies an unjustified form of personification and divinization of nature. Once again, here, Motolinia is recovering a topos of the Judeo-Christian apologetic and anti idolatrous tradition, especially from the Book of Wisdom. The implicit acceptance of this model in Motolinia's work reveal a taxonomic quality, as the friar managed to incorporate indigenous people among the Gentiles. It should be evident that Motolinia's use of naturism has a limited ethnographic value. In fact, if it allows a first penetration to the native religious system, this is possible only in terms of a translation sub specie religionis. In this direction, the application of this model fulfills a first elementary taxonomic requirement, and the indigenous gods consequently undergo a sort of selection around this principle of these four elements. In fact, in addition to the identification of Tezcatlipoca as a devil, Motolinia named an extremely limited number of gods, unraveling a, an exist, a, a sort of interpretation around this naturalistic field of action. In the first place, the Franciscan informed the reader about the veneration of a generic fire god, whose indigenous name is unknown in, in, his, in his work, uh, the lack of the name of the fire god is entirely consistent with this theoretical framework, as idolatry means a real cult dedicated to the fire itself. In the same way, the Franciscan mentioned a generic cult aimed at water, 
among which is occasionally mentioned Tlaloc, defined as water god. Finally, Motolinia reserve a brief notation related to the god Quetzalcoatl, which only of which he only emphasizes quality as a wind date. Motolinia's selection of extra human entities reveals naturism as a weak model, which provided only a, a limited effective tool in the eradication of idolatry. In fact, he consistently reproduced anti-idolatrous tradition to support the apologetic aims of his historia. The situation condition profoundly changed a few decades after the arrival of the Dose, when the Franciscan, aware of the indigenous religion resistant resilience, gave greater vigor to the eradication of idolatry. In the work of Bernardino Sagun, we found we could find a greater, greater expression of this change apostolic attitude and of a renew, renew missionary strategy that leads to a work of deconstruction of the indigenous form of representation of extra human entities. Between the 40s and the 70s of the 16th century, Sargun dedicated himself to the editing of an encyclopedic work in Nahuatl, known as Florentine Codex, which he intended to provide a textbook of pastoral action for the benefit of those missionaries engaged in the work of conversion of the Indians. However, this immense number of ethnographic details witnessed in his encyclopedia does not represent, as regard the representation of indigenous religion, the sign of a different theological interpretation or even a positive re-evaluation of indigenous beliefs and practices. As is well known, Sagun dedicated the first books of his encyclopedia to divine things, arranging according to a model explicitly inspired by Varonian tripartite theology deconstructed by Augustine in the De Civita de Dei. The religious matter is organized in a first book dedicated to gods, a second book dedicated to ceremonies, ritual feast and festivals, a third to mythology. Although testimonies of religious interests are scattered throughout the, the whole encyclopedia, it is worthwhile briefly dwelling on this first systematic construction of a list of American gods, of Mesoamerican gods. The first book of Sargantin work is therefore dedicated to the recognition or invention, again, of an indigenous pantheon and collects the description of several extra human entities ordered and interpreted according to those traditional models that guided the Christian controversy against paganism. The list and description of Mesoamerican God is not only the product of a collection of ethnographic data, but also the result of a dialogue with the Augustinian list present in the book six of the De Civita de Dei. The drafting of a list of gods, which provides the identification of 12 major entities, ends up manifesting an explicit comparative intent in the final Spanish translation known as Historia General de las Cosas de la Nueva España. However, it is worth noting how this structure pantheon paradoxically represents the culmination of a process of capturing and transforming indigenous matter. It not only testified the need to know another culture, but to rethink, to rethink this culture through a Western form of knowledge organization. The ethnographic cooperation, thanks to which Sargun would have built his encyclopedia, started around 1547 in the village of Tepeapulco, where in the help, with the help of some indigenous informants, students at the Franciscan College of Tlatelolco, Sargun questioned local elders to collect ancient religious knowledge from their own voices. Through the administration of questionnaires, Sargun tried to order data largely coming from pictographic and ritual context. In his third field work materials, collecting in work known as Primeros Memoriales, the description of the gods were actually largely made up of a series of depiction of ritual operators impersonator in the act of impersonating extra human entities. Uh, images which are um, accompanied by glosses in Nahuatl that expose the diagnostic insignia that made up the divine body. 
The Franciscan question is informant about the characteristic and qualities of the single gods, the powers that each of them possess, the ceremonies performed in their honor, and the type of clothes and ornaments worn by their priests. The result was an artificial list of the ship Tlawan, produced by Saigon in question and extrapolated from their own original context. In fact, we have no other emic evidence of list of gods, which would confirm a sort of explicit theology. Despite the resistance of indigenous informant to illustrate an accomplished pantheon, the occasional response to this questionnaire leads to a recent semantization of the impersonation of gods, which took the form of illustration and respond to that Christian tension toward the figurative and anthropomorphic representation. However, despite the attempt to hold the Mesoamerican divine matter, the 41 images contained in the Primeros Memoriales witnesses a ritual and mnemotechnical function of the images and a peculiar Mesoamerican construction of the prototype image religion, relationships. Dwelling again, on the water deities, aquatic deities, it will be enough to compare any representation of the god Lalo contained in petrographic codex, uh, codices or linked to a statue connect context to notice the radical difference imposed by Sagun in the folio 261 verses of the, primal, of the Primeros Memoriales. A transformation of the bodies of extra human entities manifests itself as a sort of spoliation, dispossession, that will develop in the next stages of the Franciscan world. In the Primeros Memoriales, the glosses in Nahuatl are still centered, although it's possible to imagine a sort of selection of the, the, the whole ra range of diagnostic insignia on their semantic dim dimension. Sagun seemed to acknowledge the existence of an emic mode of indigenous organization of sacred matter, in which an attention to divine body prevails over the Sagun in question on their qualities, attributes, and characteristics. A comparative analysis of the representation of the Primeros Memoriales would reveal a discursive order according to which a single extra human entity could be described by a listing in a descending order, objects, ornaments, and clothes, starting from the head, proceeding from the, for the shoulder, and ending with the aspiration on hands and feet. The identification of extra human entities would be possible by recognizing a, a, a series of indexes that actually make up, by means of fusions and fissions, a landscape populated by numerous distributed persons. However, this network remained largely mute. Since Sagun was not interested in investigating this semantic connection, but rather in taxonomically isolating individual gods. In the second phase of his encyclopedic work, in fact, Sagun organizes all his data according to an argumentative order that relies on text to the treatment of images, which end up fulfilling the simple role of illustration. The fate of extra human gods in the novel text of the Florentine Codex is somewhat surprising. From the 31 representation of the Primeros Memoriales, Sagun selected, selected 26 texts dedicated to individual gods, which testimonies only scatter information concerning the Teixip Tlawan, which will eventually disappear completely in the subsequent Spanish translation. It emerges, it emerges a, a surprising pantheon of 12 major gods, which would have been compared in Spanish translation with classical gods. The disruption of this emic connection between image and description that strongly bounds the god of the Primeros Memoriales clearly emerged reading the description of Tlaloc in the Florentine Codex. The description of the attributes of Tlaloc's Teixip Tlawan has lost most of its relevance, as you could notice in the end of the text, becoming here almost a mere curiosity. Sagun is mainly interesting in identifying a specific function of Tlaloc, the provider, Tlamakaski. Then in following the semantic indexical perspective, 
The spoliation of Tlaloc is clearly evident in an illustration of the gods contained in, fol in folio 33 rector of the Florentine Codex. The extra human entity loses his clothes and is covered by a simple loincloth. Tlaloc is deprived of his pictographic and diagnostic insignia and transformed into a very pagan deity, worshipped by, worshipped by a group of kneeling Indios. Finally, in the Spanish translation of the Historia General, the second team process comes to an end. The, the decomposition of the body of the Teixit Lawan of the Primeros Memoriales is complete. There is no more space, in fact, for the description of di diagnostic insignia. On the other hand, the anti idolatrous struggle deepens and delineates more and more clearly the field of action of a polytheistic god. However, if we recover another of the elements that record in the description of the body of Tlaloc, both in the Primeros Memoriales and in the Florentine Codex, a door could open on a radically different religious mentality. In both cases, in fact, the face of the god is covered with a doff, soalli, of chia seed or amaranth seed, wautli. In the indigenous rituality, amaran seed dove was used on several occasions to construct effigies of extra human entities, as shown by the famous case of the construction of the god with Silopotli. But as we have already noticed, some of them are the depictoton, the little molded ones, are connected to water gods and conceived and built as replica of the mountains. Sagun dedicates a surprisingly extensive description to the Tepictoton that I had to summarize here in a brief text. And the ethnographic data connected in this text reveal some hemic details to which attention must be paid. Let me focus on, for example, how this Teixit Tlawan made of Soali, of this uh, seed dove, receive eyes, mouth, names. This manipulation of an inert, inert matter activate the idol as a social other, as a social agent, and at the, at the same time as a recognizable entity. So the anthropomorphic form is manipulated not out of a polytheistic figurative obsession, but because its agency need to be easily abducted. The ascription of agency to inanimate artifacts do not respond to a rational error, but to the construction of social relations. In fact, despite, the, despite their apparent passivity, the Depictaton acts in ritual context, first assuming a partially anthropomorphic form, actually produced by agriculture as a collective work, and subsequently the idols receive ritual offerings and attires that are due to each they ship Tlawan. Therefore, they can, they can become an offer themselves in a process of dismemberment and distribution of their remains, which reaffirm social unity of the group and strengthen the relationship with others. This ritual dedicated to the Depictoton show their ephemeral and procedural character. The material fragment of this distributed person went back to the environment. Beyond their momentary bodily appearance, they are potentially ready, if ritually reactivated, to establish a network of relationship with the social group. So starting from this apparently singular feature of the Depictotons, we can try to recognize a general law relating to the construction of the body of gods that Sagun has not been able to completely eradicate. This allows us, for example, to look at Mesoamerican religion in its dynamic aspects. It needs to consider these artifacts as active entities. The construction of partially anthropomorphic body is therefore not a sign of a classical polytheistic mentality, but of the need to ascribe a sort of animacy to the artifacts with which they intended to establish a net of relationships. 
So the construction of the sheep lawan, whether they are made of tsoali or whether they are stone, or made of, made of stone, aim to engender a bodily access to an immense and potential base of social relations. Mesoamerican religion is immersed in the materiality of things, precisely through these artifacts. anti idolatrous truth is threatened by this ability to build things capable of connecting different sphere of reality through the manipulation of matter. Remember here that the depictedon are constitu constitutively modeled, molded. However, while missionaries seem to understand the depictedon as a sort of irrational exception, they could paradoxically embody a general rule of a Mesoamerican material theory of God. An emic perspective in which idol, the result of a double and mutual misunderstanding, embodied a non-representational -represent idea of sacred matter. By way of conclusion, and going back to the beginning of this talk, one may, we may wonder if paradoxically, the Tepictoton could aspire to enter the room of an ethnographic museum. Instead, it would be useful to ask how those less ephemeral and temporary Mesoamerican artifacts, like statue, for example, were equally immersed in a complex network of social relations with the whole world. Therefore, I think that this brief reflection of religious interpretation of Mesoamerican materiality could help us to understand how idolatry continue to manifest modern Western fear of objects. With Ingle, we can recognize how Mesoamerican religious mentality contrasts that theological Finnish artifact fallacy. Missionary idols responded to the idea that there was a creative unity between matter provided in nature and mental representation. This ilomorphism of the anti-idolatrous thought contributes to the idea that the idols are simple representation, images of God, transcendent, perennial, and immaterial essence. Otherwise, this idea can be opposed by an interpretation of relationships with environment oriented as a dialogical and morphogenetic, morphogenetic process. Idols, depictotons, statues, pictographic images, etc., are continually in use. So that facing with indigenous materiality, ethnographic museums run the risk to interrupt its social use and impose a Finnish project on it. However, Mesoamerican religiosity is always emerging, produced, and continuously reproduced at the crossroad between bare matter and socially situated action. Thank you so much.